So to some extent, I agree with him in this distinction between subjective morals and objective morals. Where I disagree, he sees as objective morality is not possible. Um, philosophers for about 300 years at this point would strongly disagree with him and by and large. As he's a PhD in philosophy, I don't really know what's going on there. So we need to think about what we mean when we say objective, what we mean when we say subjective. Right? Subjective is, my subjective experience is, this coffee's hot, the lights are bright in my eyes, and my subjective experience is unique to where I am placed in the world and how I experience things. Objective, we have a greater sense of, it's somehow a shared experience that other people can verify these things, and other people can come to the same conclusions. If we talk about the best tool for putting nails into wood, we talk about hammers. That would be an objective truth that a hammer is better for putting a nail into wood than, say, a balloon or jello or bananas. It's just not going to be effective. That's objective. And that's really what I mean when we talk about objective morality. There are ways to measure, or objective morality, sorry, there are ways to measure uh, or to come to objective moral truths using systems and frameworks. Everything that's objective is relative to a framework. Something is a meter long relative to an agreed upon measurement of one meter. Something is more hard than another based on an objective framework where we compare densities to one another. Well, like whether or not this is hard is relative to what we're comparing it against. Compared to like gold, compared to steel is incredibly soft. Gold compared to water is incredibly hard. So again, these are relative, but not subjective. So there's usually this really confused equivocation between all these terms that are just talking about. I want to make it clear that anything is objective if it is relative to a framework. So if I give you that framework and you say, and you look at the same things as me, you're going to come to approximately the same conclusion as I am once you agree to the framework. If we're using different frameworks, we're going to disagree, but that's like using metric versus imperial. Of course, we're going to get different numbers out of it because we're using different frameworks. But once we agree to a framework, it's always going to be one foot long or a third of a meter long or however you want to measure it. And that's really all that is. The subjectivism comes in where subjectivism isn't necessarily a problem. That's something is merely subjective, where it's merely one's opinion. Uh, where there's no, I like it because, you know, it makes me feel good, and that's it. That, that's merely subjective. But to say that rape is bad, rape is wrong, is not a subjective opinion. There are criteria by which we can look at morality and say, that's always wrong, it's never wrong. Right. There is no circumstance under which this is appropriate behavior, where this is correct behavior, that one should not do this, period. And that's uh, something that, Craig wants to get away from. So, and I want to make it clear, this, this differentiation between objective and subjective isn't really a religious life. I've heard several people who are committed to naturalism moving towards what's essentially nihilism, uh, because they say, well, if there's no absolute, if there's no universal, if there's no grounding, this thing we can look to for moral guidance, then there are no morals. Or uh, morality is merely a product of our evolutionary psychology. It's merely come out of the past. Therefore, it has no, Hey guys, it has no real grounding, it's really just opinion. And again, that also leads towards nihilism. That's it's just factually incorrect. There are ways you can define these things. So a lot of people have said this kind of stuff before, and I'm going to give more concrete examples. Um, rather than just saying there is objective morality, Harris does that a lot, Sam Harris, you may or may not know. So now I want to say, and here is some criteria for objective morality. There are three guys, in my opinion, who really put together the best framework. There's not a lot of women who have worked in these fields in the past. It's been generally a male-dominated industry, sorry. But there are some women who are doing a lot of work in this area now. And Dr. John Fisher, I know Dr. John Fisher in UBC is working on some utilitarian stuff, ethical of care. So first I'm going to talk about uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, came up with a system called utilitarianism, where he talks about consequences where we can measure something as good or bad depending upon the consequences of the action. And utilitarianism gets a bad rap because people use it incorrectly all the time. And utilitarianism doesn't mean, is it good for me, is it bad for me, do I like it, do I dislike it? Utilitarianism means taking into account everybody who's going to be affected by this decision. Working out whether on the whole each individual person is going to be harmed or benefited by the action. 
and he would define harm as whether or not they end up happier or unhappier. Um, normally this kind of thing takes about like four or five hours before he get into it, so I'm just sketching it out. Um, and he's talking not just merely about superficial physical happiness, but a deeper kind of happiness. So on utilitarianism, if the majority of the planet is happier from a given action, we should do it. Or the majority of people who are affected are happier, we should do it. If they're unhappier, we shouldn't. Um, utilitarianism by itself leads to some dodgy consequences. For example, if we were to enslave 5% of the population of the planet and 95% of the planet would be extremely happy, on a pure utilitarian sense, that would be a good thing to do. And we don't really go with that. So, <laughs> yeah, it seems kind of, something's wrong here. So this guy Kant, Emmanuel Kant, about this idea called autonomy, where we shall be respected as means in and of ourselves. We all have the right to pursue our own future, we all have the right to pursue our own interests, and a lot of people would use that as a kind of a gold standard in morality. So that if utilitarianism starts leading in a way that intervenes or takes apart somebody's autonomy, we shouldn't do that actually. It's a block to that. And third is a guy called John Rawls. And John Rawls, uh, he was early of the century, 1950s, 60s, 70s, where he has this thing called the, the justice theory of utilitarianism. It's a commentary on utilitarianism that basically says if we compare any two groups who are going to be affected, there's going to be a group that's advantaged and a group that's disadvantaged relative to one another. And if we're going to take some action, if the action would widen that gap, so relative to one another, the advantage become more advantage or the disadvantage become more disadvantage, we shouldn't do that. At best, like sorry, at worst, any action we take should maintain that difference. So they don't end up any, the worse off don't end up any more worse off relative to the best. And ideally we should be attempting to close the gap as much as possible. And why he says that is largely because we're not responsible for the circumstances into which we come to the world. Um, and many problems, socio-economic, psychological and all this, they all track with, to a large degree, your starting conditions, but they socio-economic and where you're born in the world. So it seems unfair to punish people through your choices. And so I've run roughshod over this pretty fast, mainly because I just want to sketch out the ideas. And I want to give people uh, something to talk about rather than me rather on for however long. So if anyone has any questions or thoughts or um, Brian, what you just said made no sense at all, can you please explain something again? That's an entirely fair question. So the, the, the UBC person, could you write their name? Oh, sorry, Brian. Yes. Oh, the professor. The sorry. professor, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm a UBC person too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's two ends. And she's working on what's called ethic of care. John Fisher, that's it. That's a very ironic name. How so? The name? John Fisher. John Fisher. John. Okay. It's a Bible thing. John, not Jonah. Anyway, so, um, where ethical care is a slight modification of utilitarianism, utilitarianism has the idea that we should all 